Hello, hello guys. Hello. Hey, uh, I'm Sham, uh, one of the organizer of Takila. So, first question: uh, How many of you are you attending Takila for the first time? Wow, a lot of new journeys. Okay, how many are you visiting f Facebook office for the first time? <laughs> okay, yeah, almost everyone. Right, cool. So, uh, if you don't know what Takila is, Takila stands for Test Automation and Quality Engineering La. Yeah, that's English La. So uh, we started as uh, Singapore RPM meetup back in 2018. So we were doing uh, meetups for only RPM, the mobile automation uh, framework. Then our folks told, hey, we need more than RPM. Okay, why don't we talk about the whole quality engineering? That's why uh, we moved to a broader perspective and we began to talk about all the aspects of quality engineering okay and we got uh, the name from our community so we had a even for suggesting what could be our name so someone suggested uh, tequila which is quite cool name and we adopted that one that's the story behind tequila and this is our 14th uh, meetup in singapore so first of all thank you facebook for giving you the chance to be here so uh, first one please tweet about this meetup with hashtag TakilaSG because we won't be having a Kahoot quiz this time. So the best five tweets guest goodies. Okay, have here. So you will be getting maybe in the next meetup only, but okay, I have got some goodies here. So please tweet with the hashtag TakilaSG so you can do it after the meetup. So the best five tweets will be getting prices, okay? And this talk will be recorded. So in case if you don't know, so basically it's, uh, it will be publicly available after a few days. So uh, I invite Raj to the stage and Raj will talk us about how Facebook do testing. It's quite interesting, right? I'm so excited. Thanks, Sean. So welcome to Facebook Singapore. I'm so excited to have Tequila in our Facebook office for the first time. And if you like what we say, we can have more of it in future. Uh, today I'm going to talk about how Facebook moves fast with stable infrastructure. I hope that there will be some learnings that you can take it back to your work and apply it there. So what can you expect from this talk? Right? At least three things. Uh, you can find out what our team does at Facebook. Uh, I know that there has been a lot of curiosity about what we're doing within our space, within Facebook Singapore. And I think this talk should give you that uh, 10,000 feet view. Uh, and this is the first time we're talking externally. So I hope that there's something new for you. Alongside, I'm also going to share our philosophy about how we think of testing and test infrastructure. There's a second point. And last but not the least, uh, we will share top 10 learnings from last one year of our journey. So it was hard to compile top 10, but I thought like at least we should share the top ones. How does that sound? Are you guys excited? Yeah. Okay, so without any further delays, I'll start. So we are test infrastructure for enterprise products. And we are part of a group called Productivity Labs. And as the name indicate, we do a lot of fun experiments and take it to all our enterprise products, and hence the name. And this is the talented team that I have the privilege to support. This team is 100% built out of Singapore. It was started in Singapore, we grew in Singapore, and believe it or not, this small team serves seven enterprise engineering locations across Facebook. So this work happens out of Singapore. And there is Shreya, she's talking later. And to tell you the truth, I'm just warming you guys for Shreya's talk. So I'm, I'm sure like you're waiting for that. So you, how many of you have seen this poster before? Okay. So that's an integral part of our Facebook culture. A few years back, this poster used to be on all our walls within all our offices. Our engineers are extremely proud of fail fast culture. And I would say that I think there's a lot of credit that has to be given to this mindset of taking risks and shipping faster. And this has caught us where we are now. 
uh, but what happens when things break, right? So at Facebook, when anything breaks, it breaks big. Big as such mean where people call the cops, right? And poor authorities, they can't bring Facebook up. So we have to be careful about what we break. And then it does get all over the news. So nobody wants that kind of press. So over the years, we learned that while we want to retain the power of move fast culture, I think that's something none of the engineers would want to compromise, but we need to change our mindset that we can't break things anymore. So when you have 2.8 billion users using your products monthly, uh, we have a certain responsibility to keep our products stable. And that's our new mantra that move fast, but with stable infrastructure. I took the liberty to add test to it because how can you move fast without breaking things if you don't have a stable test infrastructure? So test infrastructure is a subset of your, our overall infrastructure, which is amazing. And that led to the mission of our team. So we want to provide stable test infrastructure for enterprise products that makes it easier for our engineers to write good tests that can provide high quality signals. I know it's a bit of mouthful, but the key word here is engineers, that we build stuff which is for our engineers so that we can provide them all the toolings that's required for them to be able to write test in a much easier way with least friction and they can still move fast. And what happens when you do that? The quality automatically improves because you want to remove all the obstacles which are coming in the way of your engineers while writing test. So that's our goal. Uh, to see how industry looks at this problem, I just took a quote from uh, this famous book, which is how Google tests software. And if you see, I think there is a bit of a similarity in the way you think about it, that your developers own testing, developers own quality, and teams like ours who build tools for developers uh, enable them, right? So it's a very clear message that every product team is responsible for development and testing of their own products. And while we need to provide productivity, engineering productivity tools to them so that they can do a better job at it. So this is just to give you a glimpse of that. Uh, we are kind of mean uh, in the industry, there is a common thinking around how this uh, future of this thing look, should look like. And we built on top of our existing state-of-the-art infrastructure, a common infrastructure which is used across Facebook to support our enterprise use cases. So we have unique use cases which are very different from consumer products and we leverage our existing infrastructure and build on top of it to support our goals, which is for enterprise products. At this point, it's also worth uh, kind of talking about what our team doesn't do because you have to be very clear about I think, what your team stands for uh, so you can keep that focus. So the number one thing, we don't own writing test for our enterprise products. So that's not our ownership, our enterprise product engineers who are called enterprise engineers or software engineers, they do write tests for their own products. We don't just preach. So this is to say that if we don't help them write test or if we don't write test for them, then what do we do, right? So we have taken a more pragmatic approach here that we should work along with our enterprise engineers shoulder to shoulder and uh, get into those products. So each half, we identify some of our high impact products and we get involved in writing tests along with our engineers. We kind of pretty much pair with them. We have a small team where we go in, we understand what are their challenges, what's stopping them, what's slowing them down. Is it a learn, is it a training issue? Is it a tooling issue? Is it a culture issue? And we go in there, solve those problems because you could do all the tech talks, you could do all the wikis and write blogs and you could build great infrastructure, but if nobody uses that, then there's no point, right? So it's very, very important that as we build things, our products adopt it and improve. And that we do it through uh, getting involved at a level where we can understand their pain points and 
come up with solutions for them. And last, we don't limit our work to end-to-end -end testing. So though we know that I think the engineers by nature, I think they're more inclined to work unit tests, integration tests, or they may, may not have a great end-to-end -end test focus. Uh, we could limit ourselves to just fill in that gap, but we try to look at it holistically. And it's not even about end-to-end -end or unit tests or integration tests. There's a lot of new work happening in this field. I'll give a glimpse of that. We get involved in those kind of projects there. So our work scope is much broader. So it's everything that's test and reliability falls under our scope. So with that, um, let's let's look at the most important of the last part of the talk where I want to spend most of the time, which is what are the learnings for, from this young team in last one year? Now, some of these learnings you may have heard of it and it may be just a good reminder, but some of it may in fact challenge the conventional wisdom and you may not agree with it, which is fine. Uh, we will have a Q&A at the end of the talks. You could bring your points, point of views, and I think the whole idea is to learn from each other. And then we can also talk offline about some of them. So before we start, right, I want to start with this point that writing good tests, which are reliable, is an extremely hard job. A uh, lot of people underplay uh, this and they think writing tests is easier and anybody could do it while writing your product code is more complex. But I would say if you're talking about writing tests which are not good, uh, what's the definition of good? a test which is not finding things, issues, or maybe it has, doesn't have a high probability of finding something, or writing tests which are not stable or which are not reliable, th that kind of work is easy. You could write such kind of low quality test and that's fine. But when it comes to writing really good and reliable test, uh, that, works is, that work is not that straightforward and I would say that requires solid engineering. and. Some of the times I've seen that it's even harder than writing even your product code. So I want to start with that. I think that's an uh, important thing for us to all ac acknowledge, especially if we are in this space. So let me start with our first learning, which is one test is equal to one idea. It's a pretty basic thought. Uh, you may think like there's nothing, uh, something that catches your eye, but the idea is important in a way that you want to make sure that your test has just one goal, has just one objective. You're trying to only get a feedback on one thing, and that should be the scope of your test. Uh, don't try to test too many things in one test. And why? We can look at an example just to make that kind of uh, illustrate that point. So let's say you are, uh, after the work, you're sitting with your family, maybe watching a movie in the hall, and you get an alert on your phone that one of your end-to-end -end tests, like buy new product, it has failed after running for 340 seconds, right? So what can you make out of it? By just knowing that your product has, have a, has a, an important test maybe, and a buy new product test has failed. So it doesn't give you a lot of signal there about what went wrong. So you may wonder what step failed. Uh, did the landing page itself crash? Uh, were the users not able to search the product, or you're not able to add it to the cart, or was the checkout not working, or did the payment fail? So there could be many things that could go wrong in this one flow of buying a product. And if your test is such a big test, or such a big end-to-end -end test, uh, all you know is that your test has failed, and now what you have is go back to your Mac or Windows and start looking at the logs and start troubleshooting. So how about this? Let's say you have a test which just checks for the landing page. Does it load properly? You have another test which looks only for the search of the product. One only focuses on the adding to the cart functionality. One focuses on the payment test functionality. And there could be a test which may be actually causing the overall test to fail, which could be such a checkout. Now, if you get the same alert on your phone, and if you look at this and say, okay, my checkout test has failed, it gives you confidence that the rest of the things have not failed. So what you could exclude is that rest of the things are working fine. So there is some very specific problem with this functionality, which is checkout. So even without looking at the logs, you have got some 
a high signal feedback from your test that you can work upon, right? So not only this gives you a high signal when you write your test in one test is equal to one idea, but it also makes your code more modular. It becomes much easier for your peers to review your test code and do a better job of giving you quality comments rather than having a test which is, say, 500 lines of code. And then, obviously, when you break down your test, they run faster. So now your test doesn't run for 340 seconds, maybe it runs in fewer, few seconds. So you have got the speed, and this could translate into a lot of these tests can run in parallel. So now you're not running a lot of your tests, long running tests in sequence. Smaller tests can run in parallel and could complete much faster. And you could also argue that uh, the smaller tests have lesser chances of dependencies on each other or on the previous steps, and that's why it would maybe time out lesser, or maybe it would have a higher chances of completing without any issues. So overall, I think this learning tries to give you kind of a reminder that I think when you're writing tests, it has to be very clear that what is that you're trying to test, and just focus on that one thing. It will help you in a lot of ways. Let's look at the next one. Uh, invest in writing test the right way. Now you may say, what's the right way, right? There could be many ways to do it. So I could rephrase it saying that when you're writing a test, think about long-term life of your test. If the test works fine on your machine at that point in time, that doesn't mean that test would work fine as part of CI-CD. And even if it works as part of CI-CD, that doesn't mean it would work fine six months from now. So you want to make sure that once you write your test and it's shipped, then pretty much you don't have to think of it. You don't have to spend effort on maintaining it. It should be smart enough to run for a long, long time in the future unless you change something which requires you to make changes to the product. So you may say, yeah, so don't cut the corners. I think that's the kind of the advice. But you may say, what could be the reason why your test would fail? So one of the most common things that your test fail could be because of the prerequisites, what we could call it broadly as setups, which could be that the users that you use for your login, it could be the data that your test relies on, it could be the teardown that did not happen successfully, it could be even uh, your environment was not set up the right way. So these are all the things that could attribute to your test failing uh, and giving you a lot of noise. So let's look at an example to kind of make this point. So look at uh, this functionality, that you are trying to test a functionality for a minor, right? That functionality is to be used by someone who is 16 to 18 year old. So that's your business use case. So what do you do? You create a permanent test user, and let's say you create a user who is, say, 17 years, six months old. When you created the user, your test run fine for six months. What happens after six months? The person becomes 18, right? And then that day your test starts failing. So you would have a perfectly stable test running fine for six months and you did all the right things. And one day when that person becomes 18, your test starts failing. Now you may have to kind of like see that was it a false positive, was something a regression, and you spend effort on doing something that you could have avoided. So what could have been the solution here? Uh, the solution could be that every time you run the test, you create a new user and you control the age of the user. You don't assume that that user is going to remain less than 18 forever, right? So if you would have gone that one extra step to make sure that you can control the age of that user forever, you would not run into this trap. So this is just an example to illustrate my point. Uh, You check, I think. I think the slide seems okay. Good. Okay, so that's where the concept of data builders come in. So let me explain what a data builder could do on, or how it could help. You could pre create the data before your test runs. So you could have a builder that goes and does this thing as a kind of a setup activity even before the test runs so that you don't have to worry about the state of that data to change, even accidentally. Uh, one thing could be that if you use permanent data, somebody else could be using that same permanent data, and as part of a different test, 
they may change the state of that data, which may break your test. And that's a collision that happens. So how would you avoid it? You don't rely on someone's data. You have your own data builders, which create your own data, but before the test. Because if you create these data as part of your test, your test is going to become slower. So there are ways like you could make it cacheable, you could make it available, but the whole idea is you're not relying on any existing data, you're always creating your own data, have full control of the data. So uh, let me give an, another example where this may seem useful. So take the same example which we're looking at, the buying a product. So let's say landing page works fine, search product works fine. Um, search works uh, based on if the landing page works and then add to cart test is failing. And let's say that there is a genuine UI bug there and because of which this is failing. Uh, if you don't have a data builder, your subsequent test would be blocked because you have your add to cart test failing. You now can't check out. You can't do the payment because you have a bug blocking your flow for rest of the use case. Now, you're not, not getting signal on those last two tests. There could be another issue there. So how could you overcome this with a data builder? So let me give an example that let's say this test works fine, the next one's working fine, this fails. But how about if your checkout test is not dependent on add to cart? Could you do that? Could you make your checkout test not dependent on add to cart? Uh, you could maybe, like let's say the bug is in the UI for add to cart and you have a data builder, let's say called draft orders data builder. What it does is it goes and creates draft orders. Basically it adds products to the carts and keep it there. So now you have a data builder which is creating the data for you in a way where you could go and do the checkout, right? So this is creating a lot of draft orders for you and keeping it in the database for you to pick it up. You could do it through the backend, you could do it through APIs, or you could actually basically bypass this failure that's blocking you. And now your test relies on this and it works without any failure dependency on the previous test. And the other bonus that you could see is that if I'm trying to check test out and if I'm doing add to card, I'm making my test slower because I'm doing a lot of operations which I don't need to do. Again, if you go back to one test is equal to one idea concept, why do you want to add something, search something, and then add to the cart when your focus is checkout? Uh, just do that. So that way, your test becomes less dependent on something else, and you could leverage it. OK, so going to the next learning, which is bit related, make your test isolated. Uh, this is a common wisdom that is better as long as you have your test isolated. But especially when you have even end-to-end -end test, a lot of people think like end-to-end -end mean that I have to do a whole round trip with all the components involved. And your end-to-end -end could mean that you have your one application talking to another application, and then other application does something which triggers something back, and now you have a complicated flow jumping between different applications, different products. It could involve third parties. It's very, very important that even when you do an end-to-end -end test, you have to define your boundary. Uh, if you don't define the boundary and just take end-to-end -end in literal terms, you would have an extremely noisy and unreliable test, which would fail more often than not. So it's fine to mock external interfaces that you don't care about. So I, I know that I think a lot of people would think like if it's an end-to-end, -end, why do I want to mock it? I want to actually test it with that third party. That's the whole point of doing it. But what I would say is you have to uh, decide that are you testing your product or are, do you want to test your product's integration with some other product? If you're testing your product, then you need to limit it. You need to define boundary and say that I wouldn't let anything to go outside our systems so that I have more control on our environments and things won't fail. Okay, so let me give an example here. So the same example that we are working on, let's say checkout works fine, payment fails. Now, why is payment failing? So you could go and say that this payment service talks to say Visa or MasterCard gateway and you're actually making a call to it and you're trying to do a one cent payment uh, and that's how your test works. But it could be that the external service is down it could be that your ISP is down. It could be an issue with your proxy servers. Now you have too many variables. 
that you're relying on. And any of those things failing could cause your payment test to fail. Now, if it, if it fails, what it tells you is something is wrong with this end-to-end -end flow with that payment service provider, but it doesn't tell you where the issue lies. Uh, if you really want to find the issue in your payment business logic, you don't care about if uh, that particular external service is down or not. You know that your test would recover if that service is back again. So you don't even want your test to fail. So I could go and implement a very intelligent mock which acts like that whole payment service. The key thing here is that you don't want to mock the business logic part of it. It's very, very important that at what point you mock it. So you want to literally simulate a system that's acting like a payment service, <coughs> payment gateway. So you're actually simulating your third party within your environment, but removing all the network and all the other factors which are not in your control. So now you're not skipping any business logic. You have a kind of a intelligent payment gateway mock, and now your payment test passes, then you know that it was an issue with the third party being down. Uh, the only thing that could be left is that you may say, okay, then how do we make sure that that particular third party is up and running and uh, I don't have that uh, real problem there? You could have different ways to do it. You don't have to do it as part of every payment test, right? You could have a separate monitoring test that just makes sure that your integration touch points are working and keep your functional test functional and don't mix them up by complicating it, talking to third parties, which could be not in, in, not in your control. Does that make sense? Okay, so don't be the boy who cried wolf. Right? So that's my next point. If, if your test fails eight out of 10 times, what happens? Most of the time, if it's failing and if it's a false positive, it's not really a, an issue with the product, but something going wrong with your test. What happens? People start ignoring your failures. People start ignoring your test. They will say this always fails. We can safely ignore it. And once, when really it failed and caught a real issue, people would still ignore it. Right? So, you, so it's very, very important that if you don't make your test reliable and if there's too much noise in your test, then people would start relying less on your test because they would think that most probably it's an issue with the test, I don't have to look at it. And you would miss a genuine issue there. So that's a point like noise versus signal. In our terms, noise is anything which is, say, false positive, which is not leading to anything productive, waste of time, that's noise. Signal is what you want to find through that test. Maybe you want to find a bug, that's a good signal. So you want to reduce the noise, you want to improve the signal. Now you may ask, like, how, right? There are many ways you could do it. One of the very simple things that we did, which helped us a lot, was if your test fail, it should fail for a genuine reason. If the test shouldn't fail, uh, it makes sense that that particular test shouldn't even be run. Then on the fly, dynamically skip that test. Don't fail it. It's much better to skipping a test than failing it and causing a lot of noise. So decide what you want to do with your test. Do you want to fail it? Do you want to skip it? The third thing you could say is like, yes, we know that this test is failing. It's not going to happen in uh, two hours. I'm not going to be able to fix it in two hours. There is a lot of dependencies that we have to properly fix this test. So you can temporarily disable this test. So now you have three options, right? You want your test to fail when you know that it should fail. When you know that your test shouldn't fail, it's just noise. You detect that noise and skip your test. And when you know that your test is broken, it's failing, but it's failing for the wrong reasons, and you need to do more work on it, uh, then better to temporarily disable that test rather than having it run as part of your every CI CD pipeline and say, oh yeah, I know about it, let it fail. The signal you're giving it to people is that it's okay for your test to fail, right? You rather disable it and don't run them. Why to waste your resources? Why to give a false kind of a report to people when you know that the test is not doing what it is supposed to be doing. So let me show this as an example, that uh, if your landing page test is failing, does it make any sense for you to say maybe run any of these, right? If, if, uh, if it's a UI test and I know my landing page doesn't work, 
no point in trying to go and search something there. No point in trying to add something to the cart. No point in trying to check out something. I could have failed five of these tests and I could have raised a lot of alerts and an engineer looks at it and says, oh, payment is failing. And really, you know that it's not really the payments that's failing, it's actually the root cause is the landing page is failing. So what you could smartly do is have one test fail and rest all skip. So people know what's failing, they only concentrate on that and they can ignore the things which are skipping. And you have a good reason why they're skipping. You can keep an eye on the things which are skipping. Uh, let me go to the next one, kind of related to the previous one. If you don't prioritize fixing your disabled or failed test, then nobody else will, right? We have to set the example. We have to leave everything we are doing. If you're writing a new test or if you're working, doing a sprint planning, you should stop everything that you're doing and fix that broken test or fix that disabled test. Uh, this is quite important because the more number of broken and disabled tests you have, one, those tests are not doing what they are supposed to be doing. So you're either missing certain bugs that are slipping through it. And second, your dashboard looks red. People get used to it. They think like it's always red, so we can just ignore it. So you're creating a lot of tolerance for red in your dashboard. So my message here is that I think you have to f focus on fixing your test on the highest priority. That's how we have done it in our team, that it's better to have quality tests rather than have a lot of quantity. So you prioritize keeping your house in order. Keep the trunk always green. That's the message, right? If your trunk is not green, you have a lot of things failing on master. On what confidence are you releasing those things out? So you want to, your trunk to be always green or as much as possible, you want to get close to that point. Uh, there are many ways you could actually do this. Uh, one of the very common ways people build their dashboards, you could have a big monitor where you could flash your dashboard which says how many tests are broken, how, are, how many are flaky, and that metric put a, puts a pressure on everyone in the team that you have some broken tests, you need to work on them, you need to fix them, that's one way. The other thing which has worked pretty well for us is that we have automated rules that we use to send alerts to people when their tests are broken. So you find out the owner of that particular issue. If it's a code issue, then an uh, engineer has to fix that particular thing. If it's a test issue, then the test owner has to fix it. It could be the same person for both of these things, but you send automated periodic reminders. We start with like two days. Your test is broken for the last two days, what are you doing? And you don't have to do it like manually, you could automate all these things. Your test is broken for one week, two weeks, are you gonna fix it? So something like this, like you could have like a chat reminder or a message which is basically not naming and shaming people, but nagging them, poking them, kind of reminding them that it's important to fix it. So you don't have to do everything, you could use automation to automate a lot of these mechanical, boring stuff, but still get the attention of the people. Uh, next one, so delete test, right? I think I would say this is one of the most controversial one because when we tried to say that, okay, we should delete test that are disabled for more than 120 days, a lot of people felt that, why should we go so extreme? Why are we talking about deleting test? So our criteria, is that if your test is disabled for more than 120 days, submit a code diff and just delete the test. Uh, people would argue that, no, 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 it's important, it's just that I don't have got the time to work on it. But if somebody has not got time to work on it for four months, then the chances are it's either not important or people don't care or nobody's going to ever fix it. So it's much better to be honest to yourself and not live in a false hope that you have test and they're just disabled and they're just broken and they're going to become green one day. It's not gonna happen magically unless people work on it. So you have to set some hard kind of rules saying, we fix these tests within four months or three months and beyond that point, if the test is still broken, we are just going to get rid of it. So you constantly clean up your bad test. 
that's how the quality of your test suite is going to improve. Otherwise, over a few years, you would have a suite where 30% of the tests are broken, and you would say, this whole suite is waste. Right? You have to get rid of the bad tests which are not doing what they are supposed to be doing. Either fix them, delete them, write them again. Right? A bit extreme, but works. Going to the next one. End-to-end testing is not a silver bullet. Right? So we all know it. We have heard about test pyramid. Uh, but I still wanted to have this as a reminder that if your problem is something else, if the problem is that you're, you don't have a good unit test coverage, you don't have a good integration test coverage, don't try to solve that problem with end-to-end -end test. You're not going to solve that problem. You're going to make it worse. Right? So I would say don't even bother trying to write your end-to-end -end test if your unit test or integration tests are not solid or if they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing or the coverage is not great. Uh, it's very, very important that 90% or 80 to 90% of your test should be unit test and integration test. You want to keep your end-to-end -end test ready for those critical few flows that you care about the most. So you have to have a conversation with your team and don't just get into that trap of filling the unit test or integration test lack of their coverage with end-to-end -end test. A lot of teams have done it. They have failed epically. Uh, the next one, uh, yeah, I think this end-to-end -end test shouldn't be your first choice. This should be a last choice, right? So think of it this way. Work up the pyramid. Don't work down the pyramid. So next one, there is a 70% fix rate by developers if test results are reported within 10 minutes for each pull request. If you can achieve this, every time there's a pull request, there are a set of tests which are run. Now, you can't run all the tests. Now, that's a test selection problem, that which test to run. But that could be a talk of its own. We could do that in the future. But assuming you know what test to run, and if you can afford to run those tests in 10 minutes and give that feedback to the engineer when he's in the IDE, when he's writing his code, and when he's trying to ship that code, there's a 70% chance that people will fix it. This is based on data from within Facebook and why 10 minutes? You could say, why not one hour? The, the, this is like after a lot of experiments, we came up with 10 minutes is, let's say when you submit your code for review, you have some collaboration going with somebody's giving, some human is giving comments on that code. And let's say you may actually want to ship that code or you want to merge that code into the master within say a few minutes, right? You don't want to do it in hours. So your tests have to be fast enough and smart enough to give that feedback to the engineer within that time when he's working on maybe human code review comments and you tell him that the test is broken, he will fix it. And you, your test would be a lot more valuable because now you're preventing some of the things from even going into your master. So that should be your, I would say the sweet spot is, I've highlighted that in the box there. This is your sweet spot. If you can make your test run as part of your pull request step before your code gets merged into the master, you're going to get the maximum ROI. What's the next best thing, right? So next best thing is LAN and push blocking test. So you did the previous one and you still need a bit more coverage or a bit more, uh, I would say, safety net. That's where LAN and push blocking test come handy. So look at this kind of like your CI CD flow, LAN blocking test run when you are merging your code to the master. So you want to prevent some bad code getting merged to the master. So that's your land blocking. And then you want to block some bad code from going out of your system. That's your push blocking. So if you have land and push blocking test, you could prevent your master getting polluted. You could prevent some bad code getting, bad code getting shipped. So one way of thinking this could be that not every test can be land blocking and push blocking. If you make every test as a land and push blocking, your land and push would get too slow. You can't afford to do that. So you have to identify what are your high quality, high signal test. High quality in the sense that you, you know for sure that uh, if they run 1,000 times, 995 times, they would work fine. If you have that level of confidence, you say, this is high quality. High signal means that if this fails, I don't want this code to go through. 
So that high signal means that it's such an important thing for you that if this fails, you don't want this to go through. So you want to stop it there. If you have that, then you could have, say, land blocking test fail, then it stops the code from getting merged to the master. If you push blocking test fail, stop the code getting deployed to the, your production tiers. Uh, the l last one is a quote from Abraham Lincoln. I think it's a good takeaway for us there that if you have to spend six hours cutting trees, you would spend six hours like sharpening your tools. So if you apply it to our kind of thing, you should spend heavily on building your test infrastructure, which could mean a lot of things, but it could be your CICD pipeline, it could be your frameworks, it could be your fallback mechanisms, it could be your smart mocks. If you do that, your efforts for writing tests would automatically go down. Because a lot of times you may be struggling with your infrastructure, but not with your test. So yeah, you have to follow your all the best practices and the, some of the tips we talked about while writing your test. But it's, it's even more important that to have a strong f foundation on which your test run. So I would say spend a lot more time doing that right, and then writing tests would become easier. So with that, I'll summarize what we learned today. One idea is one test. So it's pretty much focus on one thing, get that right. Uh, make test isolated. Doesn't matter whether they're end-to-end -end or not. Get comfortable with taking out the variables which are not giving you any signal, but they're only making your test less reliable. And focus on testing your product within the scope of your boundary. You could have other tests which could do the rest. There are smarter ways of doing it. Write test the right way, which is where think of long term. Don't think of today or tomorrow. Okay, let me just kind of have this test and then we can later fix it. Uh, I would say that rather you write quality test, do the right setup, do the right tear down, have full control on your environment, make it in such a way that you think this is not going to fail unless not, there is no other things changing in the system. Noise versus signal, you don't want your test to be less trustworthy. This is more on the trust. It's also more on the productivity. Trust in the sense that you don't want people to start feeling that these things are not good enough. I can't rely on this. At the same time, you don't want to slow down people. Every time a test fails, you look into the logs, you spend half an hour and say, oh, this was an issue with the test user. Uh, that's not time well spent that would be like considered loss of engineering productivity. So you want to reduce the noise. You want to bubble up the good things that you can find from your test, which is the bugs. You want to not put your broken or failed or disabled test in the back burner. You want to attack them. You want to be on top of those. You have to set examples. You have to make sure that every time a test breaks, even if it's kind of late in the evening, you see that it's important that you want to uh, know why it's happening and not just have that attitude that it's okay for tests to fail. I think that's the key message. And if you're not fixing your test after a while, you could decide what's the right window for you, then rather not have them delete those tests and have a really quality suite where you could say that this suite is high quality, everything works here, most of the things works here, 99% of the things work there, and I have high confidence. Uh, don't go overboard on end-to-end -end tests, as we spoke about. This, this may not be the problem that you're trying to solve. Problem could be elsewhere. So focus on the right problem. Run tests earlier, as early as you can run, which is you can run them as part of PR. That's great. Give that early feedback to the engineer. They would appreciate it. They could stop their code from getting merged to the master. Fix rate would be much higher. Use land and push blocking test. If you have good test, and if they're failing, or if they're not being run, and still the code is being released, what's the point of having those tests? When you could always say that, oh, this issue happened in production, I had a test which failed, somebody ignored it, or somebody did not run it, and that's why uh, this bug was slipped into production. I think there's no point in regretting later. You, if you really care about that test, you have to then set those rules saying, if this test fails, I want it to be stopped. And if somebody is overriding that, then he is taking responsibility of why he thinks that's a good idea. 
right? If your test is reliable, then you should be confident about it. And the last, I would say, invest in building a stable infrastructure. It would go a long way in helping your teams uh, write reliable tests in a less friction way. So with that, I think there is a lot of great work we are doing which is going to come. We, as we say in Facebook, I think the journey is one person done. So that's to say that we have just started. There's so many things that we could do. Uh, we have not focused a lot on mobile platforms, performance, backend. Uh, there's a lot of that stuff. We, we have it in our pipeline. There are also a lot of great tools, like whether it's first testing, whether it's mutation, uh, they leverage our artificial intelligence and machine learning algorithms, and we want to adopt those tools. Like, how about if you don't have to write tests, right? If your tests get auto-generated, and they are as good as like your functional test, then you would want to do that. But this is where you have to see what to use where, and there's a lot of research work that we are doing in exploring those frameworks and bringing it to our space. And by the way, we are also hiring, so uh, there is a survey which would come to you if you have some recommendations, you could always recommend some people. And with that, I would, oh, okay, the Q&A we would do after Shreya finishes her session. So I'll invite Shreya to the stage to talk about the framework reliability. Yeah. Um, so, uh, as I've been introduced already, uh, my name is Shreya Bhatt, and I work with Raj uh, uh, for the enterprise engineering team. Um, so, like most of you guys might have already experienced, E2E has bad PR. Uh, so, we, most people don't want to write end-to-end -end tests, and most of the times we are like, remind me tomorrow, I don't want to write end-to-end -end tests right now. Uh, the reason for that is, because it can seem like marathon running is faster than test runs, right? And at the same time, it's like flipping a coin. Your test failure could be a genuine product issue or it could be a flaky test. So that is one of the other reasons why E2E tests have bad reps. And this is another one, not readable code. For example, what's that unhelpful comment in between about why there's a sleep in this code, right? So this is, again, something that uh, we always um, are plagued with. So Facebook also has these problems. We have slow, unreadable E2E tests. And that is the reason why we have test frameworks that try to take the weight off of the test writer for all these issues. Right, so we have a bunch of uh, frameworks. Uh, we have integration tests and uh, unit test framework, and one of them is an open source one, which I I don't know if you guys know about. It's called Jest, and then uh, we have backend services, end-to-end uh, -end frameworks. We have mobile UI frameworks. We have web frameworks, and in the web frameworks, we have uh, a Selenium-based framework as well as something that is new and upcoming called the Jest E2E framework. Uh, for the sake of this talk, I'm going to use Jest E2E as the baseline for uh, talking about framework reliability. But uh, the notes that are, the ideas that I will be presenting can be used for any kind of framework. So it is somewhat generic, right? So what is Jest E2E? Jest E2E is a framework that is written on top of Jest, the unit uh, test framework that I was talking about, and it uses Puppeteer. For the, those of you who don't know what Puppeteer is, it is a Google Chrome um, API, uh, which helps with headless mode as well, uh, but it has uh, uh, the other um, uh, mode as well for uh, running these tests. But one of the major advantages of using Puppeteer is that it gives you a lot of control over what uh, is run, as well as it gives you control over the network as well uh, and the timing and the J uh, JavaScript rendering and all of that. Uh, how is this useful for us? I'll explain it to you in the next few slides, but Puppeteer has been a really good framework to start off with. So the agenda for this talk is flakiness, and that's something that I think it's plaguing all of you, right? So we will be talking about what is flakiness, how we uh, determine flakiness, why we track it even, um, the common reasons for it, and how we 
fix it, right? So let's start off with what is flakiness. Flakiness is just understanding test determinism. What is a deterministic test? If its failure tells you that it is a genuine product or an infrastructural issue, then it is a, pro a genuine test failure. If not, it is a noise, right? Like what uh, Raj was mentioning before. So test determinism can be defined as a state where failures are repeatable until it is fixed. If it's not fixed and it starts passing, it's of course not uh, deterministic, right? And if there is no issue and it's failing, again, not deterministic. So how do we track this determinism of um, test? So we have something called flakiness score. The theory is up there, the probability of a non-deterministic failure. Uh, but what it actually means, I'm going to talk about uh, right now. So why do we even track flakiness score and why do we even care about test determinism? Right? This is a typical code cycle at Facebook. We write code, create PR, uh, we merge to master. In the, once the code is in the master, we build and release the code. Where does our test run here? It runs everywhere. That means that if we don't track flakiness score, we will be giving uh, the owners of these, uh, all of the steps, poor test signals. And at the same time, we are losing resources. We are simply running tests which, are, which we know are not in a good state and simply wasting resources on them. And at the same time, confusing the developers and the um, RE folks with poor test signals. They might be thinking that there's something genuinely wrong, but there is nothing wrong with uh, the product. It's just your test is flaky, right? So how do you quantify flakiness? So this goes back to the flakiness score. Um, how do we actually measure the term flakiness score, right? We run tests periodically. When I say periodically, it is three times, three to four times every hour. Why do we do that? Why do we use so many of our resources to do that? Because whenever our test is running, we are collecting key metrics about that test. The three key metrics are time taken, the test run results, and the flaky retries. I think the first and third are somewhat um, understood by everybody, the time taken and the test uh, result. But the flaky retries is something that is uh, what determines the flakiness score at Facebook. Right, let's take an example of a typical, uh, those periodic runs are called continuous runs. So let's take examples of one, some of our continuous runs. So run one, the test has passed. Is it deterministic? Yes and the status of that test will be passed. The test fails. We rerun it. It passes again. Is it deterministic? No. And it is termed flaky. The test fails. We rerun it. Fails. We rerun it. Fails again. Deterministic, right? But the test is broken, obviously, right? Um, this is an example of a flaky test. This is an actual uh, dashboard view of one of our flaky tests. And every one of those bars are one of those test runs. You can look at it and you can see the blue is a timeout, yellow is skips, red is failures, right? So this had a flakiness score of about 40%. So you can actually see that this test is extremely flaky. So what do we do with the cumulative flakiness score that we get? So all of the metrics that we collect, we accumulate it. Over a day, we have like 100 tests that run, right? We accumulate all of this and we use it in our test selection process. So how exactly does PFS or our flakiness score um, get used in our test selection? Whenever you create a a pull request and you merge to the master, we make sure that the flakiness score of your test is less than 10%, otherwise it won't run, right? And the time taken is less than 60 seconds. The status of your test has to be good. So this reduces the scope of 
uh, your tests and make sure only the best of the best run on your uh, pull request. In the master, it's a different story. So this is because whatever is in the master is the one we use for our periodic runs. So it doesn't matter what the flake in a score is, how much time it's taking, and the status is, because we want to collect the metrics, right? So for that reason, it will run uh, all of the tests, and we have thousands of them. But the frequency of those runs will reduce once your test is not in a good state. Like for example, if your test is flaky or if it is broken, then the frequency might reduce to once in a day or so, because we don't want to waste resources, right? So once it starts passing again, it will go into the good state automatically, and it will start running those tests periodically three times in an hour. Now in the build and release stage, we use, it's even stricter, right? Because what we do is we merge a lot of pull requests, and then we build and we release our code. Here, we want it to be a stricter measure, and that's why the test determinism here has to be less than 3%. So the flakiness score has to be less than 3%. And the time taken is still less than 60 seconds, and the status has to be good. OK? So this is how we use our flakiness score uh, to ensure that we are moving fast, but we are giving the best of the best tests into all the processes. Now, how exactly do we uh, make our tests less flaky? One of them I think Raj has already covered, but I'm going to get into it as well. Um, this is to fail fast. Now, has the test page loaded? If not, then you skip your test. Otherwise, you run your test, right? What does that give us? It saves us resources. It gives us better signals, like whatever Raj was mentioning, where we know for sure it is because the test load has failed and not because your test functionality has failed. And it saves us a lot of time. The other one is how to pre-create data. Why do we pre-create data? Because creating data can be flaky. For example, let's say you're right. You're writing into the database, and there's a rate limiting on your system your writes will fail, and that's why you'll have to do a retry on the writes. Flaky, right? So if your writes can be pre-created earlier before your test, you're removing that flakiness away from your test. Data propagation might be slow. It can so happen that your write might have not completed and you're already reading that data, already trying to read that data. Again, causes flakiness, and that is the reason why you have to make sure that your writes have completed much before before you do your reads in your uh, tests. Creating data might be slow. This is quite simple, right? We all know that creating data can be slow, uh, especially if there are I.O. operations um, involved. Creating data can involve many dependencies. So it could be that you're dependent on an external application, and that application is down at the moment of your test run. But why should your test run not complete because an external application is not running, right? That is the reason why you pre-create all your data, and then only you start off your tests. Now, how do we pre-create this data? So there is something called an object uh, creation code. This is done using interfaces. So we have interfaces recognized by our test infra. And then we just implement these interfaces. We have something like an implementation method where we say that this is, the this is how you generate the code. And then we also give the test infra a structure that it understands, that this is the structure of the data required. right? So that's all in an object creation code. But what does test infra do? It starts calculating how many records you need. right? So it's some pretty complicated uh, data, which is now let's say you have your object creation already in place, but then you have 10 tests which are using this object. right? So the test infra should know that there are 10 tests that will uh, use this data. And we have continuous runs. Then we will have local runs. We will also have uh, runs on pull requests. So you have to take into account all these runs and then create that much of data. right? So test infra does that, which is calculates the number of records required for all the tests. And once it is done, it pre-creates data and it caches this data. 
And when your test runs, it will just say something like data.get, and we get it from the cache. It's important to note that every one of the test run gets a, a unique record from the cache. Maybe the data inside the record is the same. It's duplicated, maybe. But the record itself is unique. And that means that the cache is hashing every one of your uh, requests. And it, whenever you request for the data and it is passed on to your test, it's removed from the uh, cache. So what are the wins for this? The setup and teardown is not part of the test runtime. And your test is only checking the functionality. The tests run faster, of course, because now you don't have to worry about your data creation. And the flakiness in the data creation is not equal to the flakiness of your tests. Now, the last bit for framework uh, reliability is how do you make the framework do the work? And this, I will delve into what just E2E specifically does. This is our new framework uh, that I mentioned earlier, Jest plus Puppeteer. Right? I'm going to take the example of the flow of the registration that you guys went through before you came in. Um, so this is a welcome to Facebook start registration page. So you click on welcome, and then you click on the social button. Right? Ah. One second. OK. So a typically good test should look like this. Go to the URL click on welcome and click on social. But we all know that this is not how it works, right? So we have to wait for that welcome button to be visible and we have to wait for that screen to be completely loaded. So we add something like a wait for navigation. So we say something like, let's wait for the page to load for 200 milliseconds, right? If you're smarter, we'll use a selector to wait for that selector. <laughs> Similarly, when we click on the button social, you would say, wait for that selector social to come up before you click on it, right? But Facebook's idea is you should just provide the test steps, and the framework should handle the rest of the things. Why should you have to say that you have to wait for welcome, or why should you have to say that you have to wait for social? It should be understood by the framework, right? So how do we do that? Now let's just go step by step. The first step is you go to the URL, right? You know that a URL is not, or a page is not loaded when the JS activity is still going on and the page is re-rendering, right? So what uh, just E2E does is it tries and understands if there are page re-renders or JavaScript activity going on in the background <coughs> and then waits for it to complete. The other one is network traffic. If the network traffic is minimal, that is the only point at which we can say that um, the page is loaded. Why do I say minimal? Because you could have polling activity going on as well. So you can't actually say that there should be no network activity at all. If it's at the minimal, then we know that the page is loaded. right? So we wait for all the network activity to go down before we declare a page to be uh, completely ready. Now, for example, we are now looking at this page, and we see that the uh, page re-renders have completed. There's nothing that is changing. Network activity is minimal. Yes, we are good to go. The page is now ready for interaction. Now we can click on Welcome. After we click on Welcome, the page has now changed. right? Now should we still worry about uh, the navigation? Should we still tell our? Uh, test that we have to wait for the social button to come up? No. So again, what we do is we check, is the page ready? Are there uh, re-renders happening? Are there, is there any network activity happening? If not, good to go. <laughs> Next, we wait for the element readiness. We check that the element is ready for interaction. How do we check that? We see that the element is visible, it is enabled, and clickable. Only then we do the interaction. All of this, again, like I said, is taken care of by the framework. So our test ends up looking like this, what we initially started off with. Our test is just this. You go to the URL, you click on Welcome, you click on Social. Everything else the framework is taking care of, it is doing in the back end, right? 
So to summarize what Jest E2E does is it takes a look at all the network activity. It takes a look at the JS activity page uh, re-renders. And it, uh, when it is trying to interact with the elements, it auto scrolls through the elements, waits for the selector to be visible and enabled. And then it tries auto retries as well, because sometimes your framework might not be the best at uh, determining that the component is ready, right? So you retry, which is completely fine. So the wins uh, with this framework is that there are no sleeps in the test. There are no repeated uh, statements, whiles, or waits in your test. Everything is taken care of. There's no stale element uh, references in your test because you're only interacting with it once it is ready. And you have readable code, as well as interactions are happening as soon as available. Right? As soon as the elements and the page is available for interaction, we are interacting with it. So we are not saying, let's wait for the selector and then with this timeout. We are doing it immediately after. So that means our tests run much, much, much faster. With flakiness, there is one other aspect that is like really, really important to us, which is like, okay, fine. So our framework is in a very good shape right now, but there is still a test which is flaky. Now what do I do? How do I debug this flakiness, right? So our alerting systems provides us some help in terms of giving us alerts whenever there's a flaky test. So what actually happens is, let's say your flakiness score, the one that we were tracking earlier, it goes beyond 30%. Then you get uh, an issue raised against yourself, which tells you that your test is going flaky. And what does the uh, issue have? It gives you a dashboard, which actually tells you all the common failures that we've seen, the most common failures. It will be a table, which will be like, this is a failure we've seen 101 times, and this is what we saw 20 times. So you know which one was your most common failure um, or flakiness issue. And then there are flaky test runs as well, so that if you want to drill down deeper, you can drill down as well. And at the same time, for a broken test, you would have uh, the stack trace in it because like, it's not an accumulation, right? Multiple, tests, multiple uh, test runs have failed and that's why uh, it's resulted in a broken test. So we get a stack trace of uh, the test. We get the test run a link itself. And at the same time, we have something called a uh, bisect, which is going and checking all the uh, pull requests that went in recently. And it tries to find the uh, pull request that might have caused this issue. So a possible pull request is linked to your um, task, and then you get it uh, uh, from the alerting bot. We also have a screenshot and video. Uh, this, I think, is already provided by Puppeteer out of the box. Um, so yeah, we get this as well. Whenever there's a failure, it gives us both the screenshot as well as the video. Um, and at the same time, this is something that we have built, which is this is the current result, and this is the last passed result. Uh, just so that you can compare the two side by side and try and understand. We're building something similar for the logs as well, where we are trying to say that at this point, so this is what uh, we had with the last pass run. And at this point, we are seeing a failure so that you know um, exactly what might have gone wrong. We also have additional logs like uh, JavaScript error logs. We have sandbox, uh, sandbox uh, console logs. Uh, we have test console logs as well as the HTML dump. Uh, exa for example, if let's say your selector was not selected properly, that way you can just, you know, with the HTML dump, go and check if your selector is still working. <laughs> to summarize, um, how do we maintain our uh, flakiness uh, for, our, uh, for all our frameworks? We track test health metrics. Uh, we let the framework do the heavy lifting. And we help debug issues with ample logs. Um, that's it from my side. I think we are we can open the floor for Q and A.